Deutsch is currently the coordinator for the Ithaca chapter of Amnesty Internationals. Uta has a doctorate in history from Binghamton University and wrote a dissertation on human rights issues in southern Brazil, in particular the intersection of immigrant rights and indigenous rights. Earlier in her graduate career, she was studying the Danube Swabians in the Balkans, which started out as an interest in her family history. She currently teaches history courses at SUNY Cortland and Tompkins County Community College. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, my talk on Danube Swabians uh, grew out of interest in family history. My mom's side of the family are Danube Swabians, which is actually an ethnic term that is relatively new. Obviously, Swabians have been around for a long time, but the group of people known as Danube Swabians, this is actually uh, a term that came about in 1922 to collectively refer to the Germans in southeastern Europe. Uh, so it is basically, you could say, a new ethnic group. Uh, my mom comes from a village just a little bit north of uh, Novi Sad, or Novi Sad, as we would say out Deutsch. So this is the village. Uh, I myself have uh, not been there. I, I've gotten as close as uh, southern Hungary. I've gotten uh, to Page in the early 80s. Uh, but uh, the goal is to, to go to a, a Gishkir today and take my mom. It's, it's her dying wish, so to speak, to go back to the village where she was born. I don't know how much background people have, so my apologies if this is old news. Uh, but in you know, kind of anticipating that not everybody knows about the Danube Swabians, uh, they were settled, most of them, uh, during the 18th century. There were three separate so-called uh, Schwaben Züge, uh, Swabian tracks. These were sponsored by the Habsburgs, by the Austrian crown, uh, for numerous reasons. One of them was uh, to, to bring more land under cultivation again. There had been a lot of warfare. There, there were struggles uh, with, with the Ottomans. And as the Ottomans are pushed back further east, uh, then the Austrians tried to populate this uh, territory. So it was twofold. One, to bring it under cultivation again. Um, much of uh, this land, especially near the rivers, frequent floods and so on, so you might have to occasionally drain it. Uh, the other reason was uh, to basically create a Christian bulwark against these Muslims to the east. Uh, in essence, what happens is uh, we have a scattering of German communities uh, all throughout. Uh, here in the 18th century, as you can see, um, we have uh, within the red line uh, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, which includes Austria, but then Austria also uh, has territories outside this boundary uh, and the so-called Hungarian lands uh, under the Habsburgs include this territory that uh, uh, is presently the Vojvodina, uh, an autonomous province within uh, uh, Serbia. Uh, so here in the map uh, you will see uh, uh, Belgrade just um, kind of on the other side of, of the Danube River here. So uh, here I have a, a German map, obviously. Uh, the, the territory, uh, the Bachka here, is uh, part of the Vojvodina. Uh, here, uh, again, you see uh, Belgrade. Here is uh, Neustadt, Novi Sad, and uh, my family's uh, village, or the village where my family comes from, is just a little to the north here. Um, what a lot of people do not realize is that uh, throughout the 18th century, about 150,000 Germans were settled in southeastern Europe. And by World War I, they comprised 1.5 million people. For the most part, they retained their, their German ethnic identity, especially German language. In some villages, uh, including the one my mom is from, over 90% of the people in the village were still ethnic Germans. This is, you know, over 150 years after they settled, uh, and they were among the last wave uh, of these uh, Swabian settlements. Of course, uh, things change with uh, World War I and the dismemberment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So what happens afterwards is that the Danube Swabians end up uh, in three uh, different states, in Hungary, Romania, uh, and Yugoslavia. Um, the Vojvodina, which used to be part of Hungary, 
now for the first time comes into this new entity, uh, which later becomes known as, as Yugoslavia. It first starts out as the kingdom, then uh, later on uh, is renamed. And it, so it's basically after World War I, in the early 1920s, that we get this, this new term, the Danube Swabians. Uh, obviously, these people came down the Danube River, oftentimes in these very rickety boats, uh, but it does not mean that all of them were Swabians. So Swabians, it's one uh, ethnic group in Germany. Um, many of them are from uh, uh, the state of Württemberg. Uh, I, I'm from the Baden side. So in, in Germany, there's a state Baden-Württemberg. Uh, the Baden side is further west. Uh, we're also along the Rhine. We're across the river from the Elsass-Lorraine, well, from the Elsass. Uh, uh, Württemberg, it's, it's further east. Württemberg, you know, you get closer to Bavaria. So that's the Swabians. That's different, right? Because we're Badish. <laughs> and we're at, we might even be closer to the Alsatians, really, than we are the Swabians. But uh, in, in any case, and, and the Bavarians, that's a totally different story because, you know, you could almost count them as independent. But uh, in, in any case, uh, so this term Danube Swabian really includes many different uh, uh, ethnic groups or, or, or people belonging to different ethnic groups that originally settled, but then collectively uh, became known as uh, Danube Swabians. Uh, not surprisingly, under um, th this new constellation under Yugoslavia, the Germans um, became a little bit defensive. They certainly seem to get along better with the Hungarians. I think both groups had this notion of privilege, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the Slavic speakers. Um, so you, you get a number of uh, organizations that are created, among them the Swabian German Cultural Association, Schwabisch Deutscher Kulturbund, but also an agrarian collective, which was very powerful because the communities would band together uh, they would uh, pool money and then, let's say, buy uh, stud animals from Austria, right? Or, or later on, then buy uh, uh, agricultural equipment. So because of the nature of these communities, uh, they did continue to have uh, an economic uh, advantage. Of course, originally when they were settled, the Habsburgs also gave them exemption from uh, taxes for so many years, exemption from military service for so many years. So uh, for other groups living in the region, you know, there was always this, this tension uh, around economic and, and, and legal privilege. Uh, we certainly have in the 1930s uh, uh, various um, Nazi organizations going down there and recruiting ethnic Germans, so that becomes highly problematic. But uh, you also have uh, organizations created in reaction, in opposition to that. So it's not as if every single German down there in the Balkans was uh, friendly uh, towards the Nazis, uh, but, but ultimately, you know, that seems to be the notion uh, that prevails. So the Catholic Action, Catholic Action, for example, uh, was in opposition to this renewal movement. Uh, the, the renewal movement was, you know, more closely affiliated uh, with the various German organizations, especially national socialist organizations. Things really changed in 1941 when uh, the Nazis uh, occupy Yugoslavia, uh, and it, it's for numerous reasons. One, they're on the way to Russia. They want to keep this, this back door open, so to speak. Um, but it, it's a little bit more complicated uh, than that. Uh, there is also some disagreement over what exactly um, Yugoslavia became at this point. Uh, obviously, we have a government in exile in, in London, and they claim while well, Yugoslavia continued to exist. Certainly, the Axis powers, which also includes Hungary, claimed that uh, Yugoslavia ceased to exist, and then all the people within the occupied territory fell under the jurisdiction of these other entities, uh, including Hungary, including the, the newly formed uh, Croatia. Um, so, so basically what happens then in these occupied territories is that people are recruited, are basically drafted, they're conscripted into these various armies. And there's also this debate as to to what degree this may have been voluntary. Uh, certainly the, the Germans, you know, they're allied with the Hungarians. They basically ask the Hungarians to, uh, you know, bring, bring all the ethnic Germans under Hungarian jurisdiction and basically uh, in, encourage the recruitment into the uh, Wehrmacht or SS. So, officially, officially the, the uh, Germany uh, maintained that the, this was voluntary, certainly under international law, they would not have had a leg to stand on, 
But I have also seen posters uh, that, that were posted in, in the German villages that were basically telling ethnic Germans, if you do not fight for us, nasty things are going to happen to your family. Right? So I think the threat was definitely there. Uh, to what degree, you know, again, legally it becomes uh, very murky and very complicated. Uh, what certainly happens is that uh, as we get further into the war, uh, by 1944, the Red Army starts uh, to make headways into Yugoslavia. Uh, Tito's uh, forces start to take control. And then at that point, uh, you, you get these notions that uh, all Germans are collaborators, all Germans are fascists, you know, all Germans are basically enemy of, of the Yugoslav people. Uh, and, and things get very, very messy. I mean, on top of having a war, meaning World War II, you basically also had the situation of a civil war. And you had, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, a, a lot of people died uh, in this context. Uh, so looking at the statistics here, uh, this is uh, Germans in Yugoslavia. The Danube Swabians also include Germans uh, that were in, in present-day Romania and, and, and in Hungary. But just looking at the Germans in Yugoslavia alone, at the beginning of World War II, we had uh, over half a million of them. So it's about a third of all the, the, the Germans in, in southeastern Europe. Uh, almost 100,000 get drafted into various armies and about a quarter of them uh, perish on the front. Uh, we do get about half of the remaining population, well, about 245,000 uh, ethnic Germans who get evacuated before the Red Army moves in. Uh, for the most part, these come from territories like uh, Slovenia, further west. Um, so you, you have these different processes of evacuation. And when it comes to the Germans in the Bachka and in the Banat, they were not evacuated in a timely manner. Uh, and then basically uh, the situation changes very drastically. Um, with uh, you know, Soviet troops now in this territory, uh, many Germans were also uh, basically uh, recruited for labor camps uh, to the Soviet Union. So we have about uh, 12,000 ethnic Germans deported uh, to work in the labor camps, and at least uh, 2,000 of them uh, die in the labor camps as well. So it's in the fall of 44 that all of this really starts to change. Uh, and at that point, we have less than 200,000 uh, civilians remain. Uh, 170,000 uh, are interned. Uh, and of those, uh, 64,000 die and have been uh, registered by name, uh, about 40,000 of those. So if, if you only look at the ethnic Germans that were still caught in Yugoslavia, that were not evacuated as they were in, in Slovenia, for example. Uh, here we have a casualty rate of the civilian population of 25%. Right? It is, in fact, uh, in German history, the highest casualty rate, uh, of, of the highest civilian casualty rate of any ethnic group. You know, so this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the story. This is my family background. This is what I grew up with. Uh, and, of course, it raises some very interesting questions. It raised some troubling questions in my mind. Of course, I grew up in Germany, which also means um, I had to take a very serious look uh, at the Holocaust. You know, how uh, can this happen? Uh, why is it that, you know, Germans ended up doing these atrocities to, to millions and millions uh, of people? And with this history of the Balkans, I was always very interested as well. How can it be that you have a group of people who, for the longest time, seem to coexist relatively peaceably. And then suddenly, seemingly suddenly, out of nowhere, it all falls apart and you have these atrocities happening, uh, you know, where, where former friends uh, torture or kill one another, uh, which, which really kind of boggles the mind. So as far as responsible groups go, uh, we have a variety. Now, after uh, the Danube Swabians, many of them uh, ended up settling again in, in southern uh, Germany, southwestern Germany, Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, and also Austria. Uh, the Danube Swabians maintain that what happened to them is genocide. Right? Genocide is a very powerful word, obviously. And with genocide, really, one of the things you need to, uh, to understand is who gave the orders. Are we talking, for example, about a government program? 
you know, where you had uh, one government, one order that, that is then carried out. Uh, and it certainly is a lot more murky uh, in this case. So you have some spontaneous groups. You have uh, private persons. You know, sometimes there, there might be uh, jealousy, rivalry. Uh, a lot of times it had to do with the fact that uh, Germans often were wealthier, right, in, in those communities. Uh, they tended to be late owners. Uh, you also then get the local people's liberation committees. You get revenge groups, or so-called uh, people's courts. Um, then military courts. And then, of course, you have also some um, uh, secret police actions. Uh, and, and the uh, action intelligentsia was not just directed against Germans, but also against uh, Magyars, against Hungarians, and also against serbo Croatians uh, who were opposed uh, to communism. You know, so it's, it's not just that ethnic Germans were targeted uh, here. But uh, again, for me, this is, this is rather murky. But um, you know, if, if you look at the extremely high casualty rate of this particular civilian group, and then if you also recognize that at, uh, starting with the end of World War II, once the, the Germans were starting to lose the war, and then going you know, into the, the early uh, post-war years, all across Eastern Europe, you had pockets of Germans. Some had been settled in, in Russia, the Volga Germans, under Catherine the Great. Uh, in, in some places, like uh, Romania, Transylvania, Germans had settled there in the 1200s. So all across Eastern Europe, you did have uh, the, these uh, uh, ethnic German pockets. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the travesty was uh, with World War II and, and everything associated with the Nazis and so on. And, of course, uh, we cannot forget uh, that we had uh, uh, 20 million Soviets uh, uh, die during the war. Um, and, and of course, then you have another 12 million uh, dying concentration camps. So given this context, it's understandable that uh, countries were very uh, nervous about having ethnic Germans uh, in their midst. Uh, but if you take a look at the fact that between 13 and 15 million Germans were expelled at the end of World War II, and, and basically were then pushed westward, uh, many of them ending up uh, in Germany, but in other areas as well. This was the largest ethnic cleansing campaign ever in human history. Uh, this is actually not anything that is taught. Uh, I teach history. I very rarely find it in a textbook on European history, for one. So it's not just textbooks published here in the United States, also textbooks published in Europe. And you know, it, it makes sense that at the end of World War II, nobody wanted to look at it. Uh, certainly, you cannot at the end of World War II imagine that it's even possible that a German could be a victim. Right? But if you take a look at the civilian populations, if you take a look at little children, right, how can we hold them responsible for what the soldiers are doing on the front? Right? So all of this uh, has raised some very uh, troubling questions for me. We did have concentration camps. Whenever I tell people there were concentration camps for German civilians, you know, this is also news to most people I have talked to. Uh, these were obviously not concentration camps that were constructed over a period of years. Many of them were ad hoc. You might have villages or you might have factories. They're going to put some barbed wire around it. They're going to have sentries every few feet. Um, but it, these were basically camps where ethnic Germans were concentrated. Um, in the bloody autumn of 1944, about 10,000 civilians were killed, uh, most of them German, but again, you also had uh, Magyars, you had Hungarians uh, as well in that mix. Uh, and by August 1945, all Yugoslav communities were ethnically cleansed of Germans. Um, if you look at the uh, Germans in all of Yugoslavia, they represented a relatively small minority. But if you look at the Vojvodina, if you look at the Bachka, in those places, they made up between 20 and 30 percent of the population. So in those places, they were not just a minor fringe group. Right? Um, so in Yugoslavia, what we had, again, starting at the end of the war, but actually the camps in Yugoslavia were not dismantled until 1948. Uh, we had uh, 20 central civilian camps and about 200 work camps. So people are, are basically uh, ferried out from, from the central camps to the work camps. Uh, we also had spe uh, eight special so-called death camps uh, in, in the Vojvodina. And uh, you know, you have different uh, population densities, but the height of it uh, was in the summer of 45, 
uh, at this point 120,000 uh, civilians, most of them German, were interned uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, I have to tell you, you know, I'm a, a historian of German history and I've had to deal with the Holocaust a lot and I would never ever try to diminish uh, the atrocities committed uh, by Germans. But if you look at the reports from this time period, if, if you look at the conditions that are described, most of the people incidentally were either starved to death or died because of epidemic disease, died for lack of medical attention. So, you know, okay, we do not have uh, the gas chambers. We do not have that kind of a systematic extermination. But nonetheless, if you look at the, the camp conditions and the way it was described and, you know, starving children with the extended stomachs or uh, uh, women, girls, grandmothers uh, of all ages being raped, uh, if, if you look at the atrocities, if you just read it and did not know where it came from, okay, you would think that what they're talking about is uh, German-run concentration camps. Right? So uh, it, I think uh, this, is, this is part of history that is obviously very painful, uh, but I think it, it does uh, need to be remembered and it does need to become part of uh, you know, our, our collective consciousness, so to speak. So all of this has raised some, some interesting questions and I really don't have all the answers uh, to this, uh, but this question of collective guilt uh, is certainly something that, that I experienced. I, mean, I was born 20 years after the end of the war. Uh, so how could I uh, be possibly held responsible for the atrocities of World War II? Uh, both of my parents were children during the war. Right? But uh, growing up in Germany, I did have this sneaking suspicion that somehow I was to blame for it. Right? This is very odd. Uh, the, the, this phenomenon is known as second generation guilt. Uh, I, I certainly struggled with it, right? But the question is, all right, uh, can we do this? Can we say, uh, let's say a group of people, let's call them Germans, um, are collectively bad, are collectively responsible? Um, and, and the comparison that comes to mind is if here in the United States, for example, you would take children from the 1970s and say, uh, you are responsible for what the U.S. soldiers did in Vietnam, uh, it would sound absurd, right? How can there be such a thing as collective guilt? It's really a lot harder to distance yourself from this concept of collective guilt, you know, be because of World War II and what uh, the Nazis uh, did there. Uh, certainly, again, if we're looking at the larger picture, 13 to 15 million people uh, expelled in these uh, uh, ethnic cleansing operations. Uh, we have to say, Okay, if we have this principle of human rights, and if this principle of human rights is actually universal, then we also need to extend it uh, to the German civilian population, right? uh, which is in many ways, I, I know, uh, difficult to do. So most of the Danube Swabians um, did um, make their way back to Austria, make their way back to, to uh, southern Germany, where originally many of them came from, you know, some from the Elsass. Uh, the, the state of uh, uh, Württemberg took on so-called sponsorship. And at the end of World War II, about 20% of the population in that state were refugees. Right? One out of five were refugees. And if you look at Baden-Württemberg today, between one quarter and one fifth of the population are either Danube Swabians or descendants of Danube Swabians, and I count myself among them, right? So uh, southern Germany, okay, so you have Baden-Württemberg, you have Bavaria, you know, these are fairly large states in the German context, right? <laughs> Maybe not over here, but uh, just think about it, you know, a quarter of that German population comes from a group that used to live in the Balkans, right? That's, that's also a connection that, that really um, is not very often made. So this is one of the houses that is referred to in, in many of the books as a colonist house. Uh, so this would have been one of the old uh, settlement houses that, uh, that the Habsburgs built. Uh, it was a colonization scheme uh, by the Habsburgs, so they would settle entire groups down. They would uh, uh, build the houses, so, so the village my mom's from was built from the ground up. There was nothing there before. I think there was just a, a postal station. Uh, they built it from the ground. People were given a house. They were given land, they were given animals, they were given seed, they were basically given tools, they were given everything that they needed to start a life there. It was a much better deal than it was coming to the United States. Uh, 
at, <laughs> at the time. Or, well, okay, uh, North America, anyhow, even before it became the United States. Um, I actually uh, grew up uh, with this history and uh, spent a lot of time with, with my uh, great-grandparents. And uh, it, we still had some, some words. I don't speak Serbo-Croatian much to my regret. I think Dobardan is about as much as I can muster. But uh, we, we did have some words that sort of snuck into our language. We certainly would periodically have Juvic at the house. And for my great-grandparents, paprika was certainly the most important uh, ingredient to, to any meal. Um, my great-grandparents would always say Ie, so I grew up thinking Ie was a word that, that all Germans know, uh, but it's actually a combination of the Hungarian Igen and the German Ja, you know, so Ie is, was yes, Ie. Uh, certainly we all knew that Kukuruz is, is corn and uh, Grumbier, uh, potatoes and, and Salash for, for the farm and so on. Uh, so, so some of that uh, certainly uh, uh, did carry over. Um, you know, so I, I grew up on these stories as a, as a young child, when, when, especially when I was visiting my great-grandparents. And uh, if, if I asked them to tell me a bedtime story, it was never about Cinderella or any of that. It was always about the bachka and back home and how life was back home. Uh, and, you know, so for me, this was very intriguing. Again, not only because when they were talking about this life back home, it was a harmonious life, and it was a life when they got along with their neighbors. Right? Both my great-grandparents were bilingual in Magyar. Uh, my great-grandfather certainly spoke Serbo-Croatian, also a little bit of Russian. And later on, he learned a little English. Um, it's just very intriguing to me. How can this happen? Right? How can people live together for so long, and then suddenly they, they cannot? So this is a question that has preoccupied me. So the Danube Swabians, when they resettled in Germany, many of them resettled in the same area. So for example, the, the village uh, where my great-grandparents lived, almost everybody in that entire village was from Kishkir. And you know, even in the 70s, as I was collecting these stories, um, my, my great-grandparents and, and even my mother, they knew exactly, okay, now these people, they're the old Germans, right? Uh, but, you know, these people, okay, they, they're, they're the refugee, they're the Flüchtlinge, uh, you know, just like us. So, so this identification, being refugees, being expellees, you know, 30, 40, 50 years after the fact, is still very deeply ingrained. It's just something, I mean, my mom was six years old when she was expelled. She's never going to get over it, right? The, the uh, expulsion, the flight, you know, it, it looms larger than life, and I think the older she gets, the larger it looms. Uh, it's just something that uh, she's, I don't think, ever going to be able to get over. But um, this whole notion of, of Germans as victims, or um, I shall say German civilians as victims, uh, is really something that was not possible to, to talk about until Germany got reunified. And it's really only with the reunification of Germany that you start to get a flurry of scholarship, and you know, some, some serious scholarship before that, uh, it, it was more anecdotal, you know, here's the story of our village kind of thing. <clears throat> but it's really only after unification that you start to get a, a serious examination of these issues and the Germans uh, felt confident enough to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, in a war you have civilians, you have children, and in a war, even if, you know, your country is the aggressor country, there are victims. And many German civilians felt, and especially the ethnic Germans who did not live in uh, a Germany proper at the time the war broke out, you know, they felt that they were just as victimized uh, by the Nazis uh, as other people in, in, in Europe were. Uh, so in, in the early 1990s, they started compiling this, this, this massive collection. It's four books of about a thousand pages each in uh, uh, this collection, Leidensweg, der Deutschen im Kommunistischen Jugoslawien. And basically what you have is you have a collection of eyewitness accounts uh, we also have these uh, so-called Heimatbücher, uh, where basically the, the, the people, as they recongregated uh, in Germany, would publish these books about the village back home. So it might be about village history, but uh, 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 Germans, uh, uh, true to their um, fascination with detail, I mean, each book has a listing of exactly uh, everybody who lived there and what street they lived on and, and where they ended up afterwards, you know. So, uh, it, it is uh, uh, quite a compilation 
uh, of material. So uh, uh, last but not least, um, you know, the question of human rights and, and, and ethnic conflict uh, has very much um, interested me for some time, which is also why I became an ethno-historian. But, um, you know, part of, you know, why, why do Germans need to remember this? You know, why, uh, why can't we just uh, forget and move on? Well, some of it really has to do with that, one, there was suffering, and they want the suffering to be understood. They want it to be recognized, right? And it's also become really a key identifier, especially for Danube Swabians. Um, again, the problem with collective guilt and targeting civilian populations, uh, if we recognize that human rights are supposed to be universal rights, then that would also include this group. Right? Um, barriers of language and access to archives. Uh, I did start um, to work on the, on the Danube Swabians when I first got to grad school, and then very quickly realized that I could not uh, fruitfully pursue this further uh, for several reasons. One, I don't speak Serbo Croatian, <laughs> right? So I can only tell you this story uh, from the German perspective and the, you know, the, the German archival material that I have and the German language materials that I have. Um, but, but the other problem is too, after the Germans were expelled, there was just a lot of archival material that was destroyed. So if I were to go back to Serbia today, I don't know how much I would find, but from what I have heard, you know, the vast majority of it has been uh, destroyed. So there's uh, uh, that problem uh, as well. Uh, there was something else, you know, as, as I, you know, hearing these stories, especially from, from, from my mom and from my family, uh, I understand the suffering. And I also understand the purpose of, of these publications. But what these publications will not tell you is the other side of the story. They are not intended to be balanced histories. But uh, one reason why I did want to talk about this today uh, and, and bring attention uh, to you about the Danube State, uh, Swabians is because for, for them it also is a matter of reclaiming history, right, and, and basically uh, making it understood. I mean, this is a history, you know, that even within Germany it's not that well known. Certainly the younger generation seem to have no interest. I know among my siblings and my cousins, I'm the only one, you know, the rest of them are just bored to death, you know. I've, I've heard it a million times, can't we just move on, and, you know, that was back then. Um, so the Danube Swabians are actually in a very pecu peculiar situation. My mom, who was born in 38, uh, she was six when she was expelled. She's now in her early 70s, but she's basically one of the youngest people in that group who still have a live memory uh, of the Bajka. Many of the people who were uh, teenagers or, you know, in their early 20s or who actually participated uh, in the fighting, they're now in their 80s and 90s. So this is a generation that is dying off very rapidly, and the subsequent generations, quite frankly, don't have that much of an interest. So what happens here for all these Danube Swabian uh, uh, groups uh, in southern Germany, you know, their membership is falling, they, they cannot generate as much dues and so on. And all these publications, incidentally, uh, would not be possible unless you also had subsidies from the state, uh, for example, uh, Baden-Württemberg. But uh, back when I did uh, initially try to explore this further in, in my early uh, graduate student career, uh, I looked at some uh, Yugoslav books, you know, the, the history of Yugoslavia. And it was very striking to me that the Germans are written out of that history. Right? Completely. They, I mean, you will be lucky if you find a paragraph in a 300-page book that Germans were ever here. And it very much reminded me of, uh, you know, what was going on w in the Yugoslav War, where, you know, for example, you would have uh, uh, mosques destroyed, and then you have a parking lot paved, and then you have all the, you know, books and archival materials in the archives destroyed. And if you do that, then you can proclaim, what? There were never any Muslims here, right? What? There were never, you know. So uh, the, the Germans have literally been written out of this history, and, and I mean, again, I understand why this happened. Um, but if you consider that in that region they comprised about a quarter of the population, uh, I think, um, you know, it, it is important, in essence, uh, to, to reclaim this history. So. Thank you so much for, for coming and welcome. Koga pesna zapeje, slave napeje. Koga oro zaridra, srce radigra. Da nima na ovo.
foi bem. 